you, if you were to reflect over the last seven days of your life, would say it was a good week? Anybody? We got a few. Okay, how many would say a so-so week? How many would say a rough week? Okay, we got a few that are honest who would say it's been a rough week. Well, uh, one of the great things about Christmas is this reminder that no matter what season or what week we've had, our God is one who wants to step into it. In the same way he stepped into broken creation, he wants to step into our lives and be present and be real and reveal himself and let us know that we're, we're not alone. Last week, as we kind of kicked off this Christmas series through the season of Advent, I asked you to kind of close your eyes and just envision how you would describe the best Christmas you could ever experience. Now, for some of you, maybe you'd go back to a Christmas when you were a kid, or you go back to a Christmas when your kids were kids, when they were young, um, and you would say, that man, it'd be hard to top that Christmas. It'd be hard to, to have an experience or a season that was, was that intense. Maybe it was someone in your life that has since passed, and now Christmas just isn't the same without mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or a spouse or a child, and, and that, that brings up some grief every year. Uh, maybe some of you would say, I've not yet experienced, I think, the best Christmas ever. I have hope that there's something more I can experience. Well, whatever it is you would use to describe or envision the experience of Christmas being becoming the best one ever, to make you enter into 2018 and say, I never experienced a Christmas quite like that one, all of us would basically be saying that, that, that we have this desire for more. We would all be describing this more, that, that if we experienced it at Christmas, that's what would top all the other ones. When we, whatever you envision in your mind, the more is a part of it. In your mind's eye, you would define the best one ever by something more or better than you've ever experienced before. So you have to fill in the blank, more what? I want more. I want more. Now, some of us would, would maybe be tempted at first to say, well, I want more smartphone. I want more gadget. I want more technology. I want more clothes. I want more shoes. I want a, a new winter coat. I want, I want more boots. Not that you don't have boots, but you just want different colors of boots for winter, right? Maybe it's more sports equipment. More, maybe it's more entertainment or experiences. Maybe you look and you're like, you know, I want more furniture in the house. You might say, I want more house or I want more car. I don't know. Maybe for you it's something different, something maybe a little more elusive, something you can't really pay for. Maybe you'd want more time off work. Maybe you want more time away, more time with loved ones, more time to travel. Maybe just more downtime would define the best Christmas ever to you. Maybe it's more close friends. Maybe you kind of feel uh, oftentimes kind of on the outside looking in and you wish you had more close friends. Maybe it was more spouse in your life. Maybe it was a spouse. Maybe it was more, more in your marriage. Or maybe it was more babies. You've got one or two or a few and you want more. Maybe, maybe it's more time with your kids. Maybe it's more for your kids this Christmas. Maybe you're hoping they see something more than what they've seen before. Maybe you look at your grandkids, more time with them. Maybe you would say, well, I've got a couple grandkids, but I want more grandkids. I don't know. Maybe you would say in relationships, I want more from mom. I want more from dad. I want more from my son, more from my daughter, more from my spouse. Maybe it would be things that are more spiritual in nature. I want some things that, that we can't really birth in our own lives, but only God's Holy Spirit can birth in us. Maybe it would be more joy, more peace, more patience, more happiness, maybe a better sense of purpose in your life, maybe a better future than what you've experienced up till now. The fact is, as human beings, we desire more. I desire more, you desire more. That, that kind of is why we set goals. It's why we chase goals. It's why we have schedules and plans and things we want to do and places we want to go and things we want to experience because we have this dream of a more and better life than we've currently experienced till right now. The problem is sometimes we think we're the author of that dream for more and better. That we think that's, that's our desire, but, but did you know the fact that we aren't the author of a dream for more and better, that this drive we have within us, there's a different author of that dream for our lives, for a more and better life. In fact, in John 10, 10, Jesus says this. It's not a scripture we often equate with Christmas, but it's got a very Christmas component. In John 10, 10, Jesus says, I have come, Merry Christmas, I'm here, I have come so you can have more and better life than you ever dreamed of. Talk about the coming of Christ being a Christmas text. John 10.10 10 is a deeply Christmas-oriented text from Scripture. Jesus himself tells us he has come for you to give you something you inherently want and more than you can ever dream of. Now, Jesus clarifies that your dream for more started as his dream for more in your life, more for you, and his more and better 
will far, be far more impressive than your vision of more and better. Now, did you notice something Jesus didn't say? He didn't say, I have come to give you more and better afterlife than you ever dreamed of. But here in this world, it's broken, it's flawed. In this place, there isn't much I can do for you, so good luck with it. Hope it works out. But just wait to the afterlife, and that's where you'll get the more and better. He doesn't say that. He says this salvation he's come to bring, that this freedom, these chains that are breaking, this relationship restored with God, it doesn't wait to the afterlife. He's come so we can have more and better life now, here, than we've ever dreamed of. So that begs the question, well, well how does Jesus define the more and the better? Because maybe Jesus' definition of more and better, his explanation of more and better, isn't quite what I would describe or explain as more and better. Well, last week, we identified the shepherds. This week, we'll look at the life of Joseph, and we'll begin to answer this question. What does the more and better that God had in mind for Joseph's life look like? Because it didn't quite match what he probably predicted for his own life. We looked last week at the, at the shepherds and the significance of their invitation to the manger of Jesus. Because in so doing, God reveals the more and better plan he had for these shepherds' lives. They, they felt on the outside looking in. They felt uninvited. They felt uh, ostracized, marginalized, and God invites them in close. He wants them to see that who they are, who they thought they were, and who other people think they are is not true. Those are assumptions at best. <coughs> but who God thinks they are is the truth. And so he shows up, sends an angel to speak to lowly shepherds in such a way that he immediately elevates their worth and he changes the way they see themselves, changes who they are in an instant. The first thing we saw last week is that they were no longer enemies of God, but now they were friends. God tells us this specifically about us, that, in, that, that part of the gift of salvation is not just saving us from our sins, but we actually change teams. We're no longer an enemy of God, a combatant, but now we are a friend of God. He's made available to us the whole purpose for why he's here. The second thing we saw is that they're no longer distant from God, but they were complete in him. Sometimes we can feel like there's this vast expanse between us and a holy God, but, but God wants us to see the reason Jesus came is so that he could live how we couldn't live and complete our salvation in the person of his son. The third thing we saw last week is that they weren't a piece of junk. As many people would assume, as a shepherd, that's all you are. But instead, God helps us to see that we are his masterpiece, recreated in Christ for a purpose. And the fourth thing, many of them would have felt alone and isolated from the world around them, even from family. But God shows up, <coughs> and he establishes with the shepherds, and he unpacks it throughout the rest of the New Testament, that he is creating a new family, and he is a loving dad who has our back. See, God's more and better plan for the shepherds, it's filled with hope. It, it's filled with a reality that is far beyond all that they could ask for or imagine for themselves. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 1 today, and we're going to look at God's more and better in the life of Joseph. And starting in verse 18 of Matthew 1, this is what Matthew, the Jesus follower, captures as a part of the the, the origin story of Jesus, the birth story of Jesus. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, what that in essence means, before they're married, before they have intercourse, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Remember those explanations of who Joseph was. Just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, what decision should he make? Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear, remember that word, fear, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. We reflected on this last week. In Isaiah chapter 7, seven to eight centuries before it happened in Bethlehem, Isaiah said, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 24, When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not, so they didn't have sex, until she'd given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus, as the angel instructed him. Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, that I have come to give you more and better life than you could ever dream of. So let's look at the man selected by God to be the dad influence 
in Jesus' life, the, the life of God's son in the flesh, the man that Jesus would call dad, Joseph. Now, what we can see about this more and better promise is that there's things here that most of us would say, yeah, those were aspirations for our lives as well when we would have been Joseph or Mary's age. The aspiration of marriage, the aspiration of a family with children. I mean, those experiences are incredibly fulfilling and enjoyable, but we also know enough that the, that the reality that marriage is hard. It's hard to live out this challenge God gives us in Ephesians 5 of, of mutual voluntary submission of serving one another, of actively listening, encouraging one another, walking through life together for the rest of our lives. That's, that's hard. And, and there's a lot of people in our culture that aren't up for the journey. They, they, they're ready to walk away. So it is a hard thing. It's, not, it's very enjoyable, very fulfilling, very satisfying, but it's also very hard. It's also very hard in certain seasons to raise kids. There's seasons where it doesn't all make sense, where it's not all predictable, where one plus one does not equal two, but you're still trying to figure out what's going on. Now, for Joseph, his experiences of, of both of these dreams would be, th these gifts that he would be given would be incredibly difficult and filled with drama. And I want to touch on some of the drama that Joseph's life was filled with. First thing, the woman that he was betrothed to marry, that he was starting to develop a relationship with and where love was growing, would one day pull Joe aside and tell him after their engagement, but before their wedding, that she was pregnant, but that she didn't cheat on him, but that God's Holy Spirit impregnated her. The second element of drama then would be Joseph deciding whether he continued forward to marry this crazy lady who thinks that the Spirit of God impregnated her or withdraw from her. Would he continue the engagement or would he withdraw from it? The third thing of drama is that ultimately because of this vision he had from God, he would choose to continue his commitment to marry her because of his faith. Not in her, but his faith in God. That this was God's plan, this was not a deception, it was not an accident. And Joseph would willingly face the speculation and accusations that would come at him from the very community in which they lived. Their friends and their family, Many, most of them would not believe this story that God was presenting to them. And so either A, they would people around them would talk about them and Joseph and Mary... And people would, would basically refer to them or think about them as not honoring with conviction the commands of God to maintain purity before marriage. Or B, they would believe that Mary was kind of fooling around behind Joseph and Joseph didn't have the guts to leave her. Really, that's what the majority of people on the outside would think about these two people. Now, we know what scripture says about their character and their integrity of the highest level and their desire to be obedient to God. But from the outside looking in, people would make assumptions. And so Joseph was willing for the assumptions to be made in order to be obedient to God's calling on his life. The fourth thing then is that G Joseph, much later, would then have to sneak Mary and Jesus out of the country to escape to Egypt for years to prevent the evil King Herod from killing baby Jesus. Now often when we think of the more and better for our lives, the dreams we have for our future, we don't think of the hardships and the struggles that we'll endure. We think about the joy and the pleasure and how awesome that'll be and how great it'll feel and all those kinds of things. Yet often, the more and better that God has in mind for us will require faith in Him to lead us through it because it'll be something on the other end that is bigger than any of us had ever imagined or thought was possible. See, the payoff, the blessing of obediently following God's lead in our lives it is to experience something in our lives more and better than we could ever ask for or imagine. Like Joseph, having the honor that of all the men born on planet earth, he would be the one that the savior of the world would grow up and call dad. He would be the one who would be the primary male influence in the life of the savior of the world. See, God's invitations for us are often uncomfortable inconvenient and intrusive into our lives. Yet, God invites us to join him in something that will completely change who we are. It will change our lives for the better. We may not see it in the moment. It may look like it's hard. It may look like it's a struggle. But when we say yes to Jesus on his terms, the result is always more and better than anything we could have currently experienced. So Joseph is here and he has a choice to make. The same choice each, and every, choice each and every one of us have to make every single day of our lives. Will we engage in the calling God has placed on our lives? Will we be obedient to where God is calling us to be led in our lives? 
Will we participate and become involved in his plan, or will we, will we withdraw, remove ourselves, and do it our own way? When we look at the context of Joseph's life, we get a hint at his heart. Because according to someone's actions, we can see what it is they really fundamentally believe. Let's revisit just the first two verses here. The birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man, so we're told about his spiritual condition, a just man, a righteous man, someone obedient to God, so that tells us about who he is spiritually. And unwilling to put her to shame, that tells us about who he is in, in his character and integrity. He could, he could completely go public with this and in a way completely demean her publicly. But he, he, he said he didn't want to put her to shame, so that tells us about his character and integrity resolved to divorce her quietly. This tells us that he wasn't emotional and spontaneous and reactionary. Well, that's it, then I'm done, I'm out of here. No, he measured what was the obedient response to honor God and to honor this woman that would be my wife. What is the right thing to do? And so he resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he was considering his response, as he was mulling over what to do, he wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to obey God. After all, he was a righteous man. He wanted to be obedient to God's law. That was his desire. And initially he believed the right thing, the right response was to not go through with this arranged marriage according to God's law, but to end things quietly, let her live his, her life, he will live his life. But it was while he was considering the right thing to do, while he was seeking God to say, God, what do you want me to do? What's the thing that's going to honor you? That God showed up and made it clear to him. He said, Joseph, I want you to go through with the marriage. Because everything that Mary has told you is true and accurate. It's not a deception. It's not a lie. In fact, this has been my plan all along. This child that we born, his name will be Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. <coughs> In Joseph's reaction to this calling God's placed on his life, we can see three things about what Joseph truly believes about who God is and who he is in Christ. Joseph chooses to engage in God's plan for him. He doesn't withdraw, but he engages. He, he pushes all his chips in the middle. He says, I am all in. And even though his life would look differently than he probably planned for himself, we could describe Joseph engaging in the will of God for his life in three ways. The first one is Joseph chooses to be present. Joseph could have withdrawn. He could have said no. He could have turned his back, said, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't know. I, I can't trust you enough, God, to know that this is not, that there wasn't something fishy going on. No, Joseph chose to obey the calling of God in his life. He, he chose to step in and be present. Be present in God's will, but also to be present as Mary's husband and to be present as the father figure for Jesus' life. You know, Christmas is all about the arrival of the presence of God with us, Emmanuel, and in that moment, when Jesus was born, as God's presence stepped out of eternity into time, as the creator became creation, that was a gift given to us. And sometimes we think, man, it only lasted three short years and then it was gone. Jesus was here for such a short time and then he was gone. But some, so often we forget or we neglect to believe the fact of what Jesus said. It is good that I go because then my Holy Spirit can come. I'm, Jesus was, was bound by limitations as one man in one body in one place at one time. He had to sleep, he had to eat, he had to go to the bathroom. He had all the limitations of humanity stepping into creation. But he wanted to give us an understanding of who his father was, which is why he did it. And he had to live the life we couldn't live so he could pay the penalty for our sin. But when he ascends back to heaven after the resurrection, now God's Holy Spirit is not limited. He can be everywhere all the time, all at once. So Jesus, in physical sense, would only be here for a little while, but it was just the beginning. It was for him to build relationships with the disciples, to give them an understanding of who his heavenly father was. was. Jesus' presence was significant as a gift to his disciples. But now we're told about who we are because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and that God is still present with us in a much more intimate way than God was in the person of Jesus. See, God says who we are as it relates to his presence in our lives, God with us. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says it this way, all of you believers, Christians, disciples of God, disciples of Jesus, you surely know that you are God's temple and that his spirit lives in you. See, this means if you're a disciple of Jesus, a Christ follower, a Christian, you are, I am, the temple of the living God. 
But we're the temple of the living God. God's presence came in Jesus and he was physical, but then he died and rose again and ascended to heaven on the day of Pentecost. God's Holy Spirit now inhabits his children, his regenerate children. We carry God around with us anywhere we go. That means what's beautiful about that is when you are having a hard week, a rough week, a difficult season of life, you don't have to go somewhere and set an appointment and hope to get God's attention. No, wherever you are, just speak and he's there. He knows what's going on in your life. Just tell him about it. He wants to be present with you and he wants you to be present with him in relationship. That's the gift of his Holy Spirit. Oftentimes we just forget it because we get so wrapped up in our circumstances or we just don't believe it. Well, obviously if this has happened, then God isn't faithful and he's abandoned me. We just don't believe it. God is present with us and even says who we are, it's not something we control. Who we are are the temple of the living God. He's present with us and he invites us to be present with him. The second thing we can see about Joseph engaging in the calling God placed upon his life is that he was active. He wasn't passive. What we know about Joseph is he wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to be obedient. He wasn't just going to stay back and take his hands off the control. No, he was going to actively be obedient to what God was calling him to do, the noble, the righteous thing. No matter what God had asked, he would say yes. So he was going to be obedient to the law of God, and he was going to break this engagement with Mary quietly. He didn't want to demean her. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't want to kind of rub her face in the mud and let people laugh at her. No, he just, he simply was going to withdraw and let her go with God and him go with God. But God tells Joseph that, that obedience in this situation looks differently than what you're thinking. He says, Mary's not lying. This is the truth. This is what I've been building to throughout the entire history of mankind. And God is inviting Joseph to trust him to a degree he's never trusted him before. To trust him that God's plan for Joseph's life is more and better than Joseph's own vision or timeline for his own dreams. See, sometimes God's invitation is intrusive. It's inconvenient, yet it is God's invitation alone that brings about the more and better life Jesus promised that is beyond anything we could ask or imagine. Can you imagine stepping into the sandals of Mary and Joseph? If you were given the task, the opportunity, yes, the honor, yes, but you were given the task to be the earthly mom to the Savior of the world, the earthly dad to the Savior of the world, would that invite stress in your life? Would the worry you think you have to navigate on a daily basis go to a whole new level that I'm not screwing up the Savior of the world, right? I mean, we, we oftentimes don't know how good we're doing as parents until we get a couple decades down the road. And then we reflect, we're like, wow, I really... Really mess that one up. Can't go back in time and change that. In Joseph's response, to quickly respond, and it says, and then he awoke and he took Mary as his bride. Like there was like no hesitation in Joseph. In his quick response, we see that what, what he didn't care about was what people on the outside thought of him. Not even his family and friends. What he cared about more, more than anything was what God thought about him. Whether he was obedient to God, or disobedient. Joseph also knew by being a Jewish man and being aware of the law of God because he was obedient to it, he was a just man, we can also assume Joseph had a good working knowledge of the history of the Jewish people throughout the Old Testament. And so Joseph knew that that this task God was assigning him, that he was inviting him to, it would be hard, it would be stressful, but he knew the strength and perseverance to do what God was calling him to do did not rest in his own power. But like so many heroes of the Jewish history that had come before him, God would show up and give him what he needed in those moments. Men like Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Joseph of the Old Testament, not the New Testament. Joseph that would be sold into slavery by his brothers and then rise through the ranks of slavery to become a leader in Potiphar's house only to be falsely accused, something he didn't do, and then be put in prison again. All of those were terrible situations, horrible things, hard things, difficult things that lasted for years. The privileged son ending in the pit of a prison, but then later elevated to be the right hand to Pharaoh and provide provision for the Israelites to not die of famine. Moses, Joshua, David, Daniel, Elijah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Esther, so many others. Joseph believed God was faithful to deliver what it was they needed, the strength 
the composure, the conviction to do what God had called them to. The same is true for you if you're a disciple of Jesus. The same is true for me. No matter what you face, no matter how inconvenient or uncomfortable it might make you feel, if God is behind the calling on your life and you've said yes to him, you just engage in obedience and God will take care of the details. You don't rely on your own strength. You rely on his In fact, listen to what the Apostle Paul talks about when he says who we are now because of what Christ has done. In Philippians 4.13, for many of us here, we may say this is our favorite verse in the Bible. Maybe we'd say it's our life verse. He says this, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ. The whole emphasis of this series is to revisit the powerful gift of Jesus' life and how his life, death, and resurrection change the core of who we are. We don't have to do anything to experience these promises. God has done it all for us. And this is now who he declares we are in Christ, in relationship with God, through Christ, in faith. Salvation changes who we are. Throughout the New Testament, God tells us in dozens of different ways. And here in Philippians 4, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ. The question is, do we believe it? Do we build our lives and live our lives based on this as a fundamental truth we believe? That there is nothing that holds me back. Except me, I can do all things through Christ. Even in those times where we're battling against our own desires, our own sin, our flesh. In Galatians 5, Paul would get more specific in this idea. And he would tell us not only can we do all things through Christ, but he gets specific. He says, we can overcome the flesh by living in God's spirit. I mean, think about the progression of these things. We we talked about 1 Corinthians where he says, I am the temple of the living God. The presence of God and his Holy Spirit now goes where I go. He lives in me through salvation. And now because of his presence in me, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But even more specifically than that, I can overcome the the desires of my flesh, the temptations that I have, the ways I've fallen in the past. I can overcome my flesh and the drive that it has in me when I live in God's spirit, when I live nurturing my relationship with God, aware of his Holy Spirit's presence within me, the same power that raised Jesus from the grave. So the presence of God is with us, and the fact that we're the temple of the living God and he lives inside of us assures us we can do all things and we can even overcome our flesh. The third thing we see in Joseph in in him choosing to engage in God's calling on his life is he chose to lead his family forward. He wasn't going to follow. He was going to step forward to be the leader of his family. In the very next chapter of Matthew, we're told that the Magi arrive, or the wise men. For many of you, how many, you have a nativity scene at home somewhere, you have it on the background of your phone or your computer, right? You've seen it in front of a church somewhere or wherever. Yeah, well, oftentimes, like, we have the camels up here, you know, on stage, and we've got a manger over there, it's beautiful stuff, and, and um, so you think of the nativity, you think of Mary and Joseph and Jesus in the manger, and you think of the animals and the shepherds, and then the camels and the wise men, and most nativity scenes have three wise men or three magi, uh, yet scripture never tells us there were three of them, it just says they brought three gifts. What we do know about scripture is that when the magi show up in Jerusalem, Everybody knows it, so chances are it was a much larger crowd than just three people, because in a city of 50,000, you, if you're going to cause a stir, you bring in a lot of people, and so their servants and animals and pack animals and all those kinds of things roll into Jerusalem, and everybody knows that they're there, and they're talking about this baby that's been born, this king. Well, a lot of us have the Magi right there in the nativity scene with us, like you see that in churches, right? There's the three wise men. But that's unbiblical, because what we know in Matthew chapter 2 is that the Magi were not there at the same time as the shepherds. Now, this may be blowing your mind and saying, how could that be? That's not what my nativity scene has. Well, if you want your nativity scene to be biblical, you just need to do two things. One, take Jesus out, because it's not Christmas yet, so he's not there yet. So put Jesus in the box till Christmas morning, then make it a big deal, bring him out, sing him happy birthday, whatever. The second thing you need to do is you need to take the Magi and like put him in the garage, because they haven't left yet, they're on their way soon, they will be packing up to leave. But we know based on, on history that when the Magi arrive, they go into the house where Joseph and Mary and Jesus are. At that point, they're no longer in a, a stable, there's no longer a manger. Uh, some scholars say it was at least a few months, maybe even up to a year, until the Magi arrived coming from the Far East. But in Matthew chapter 2, we see something more. The Magi arrive, they bring the gifts, then they leave. What they don't know at this point is that King Herod, who was very inquisitive of the Magi to know who this child was that was born from the 
perspective that he wanted to come and worship him and bring him a gift as well, he was lying to them. See, King Herod saw this prophesied king being born in Bethlehem as a direct threat to his throne, his power, and his crown. And so King Herod actually puts forth an order for his resources to be deployed to murder every child male under the age of two years old. Having no clue what King Herod was up to, God, in a dream, again, gives an instruction to Joseph in much the same way he did before in Matthew 2, verse 13. Now when they had departed where they were after the Magi had left, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, Joseph. Take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And right then he rose, Joseph awoke and took the child and his mother by night. They didn't even wait for the sun to come up and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of, the Egypt, out of Egypt I called my son, which is in Hosea chapter 11, about seven centuries. That's what God tells them about the coming Messiah. So jo Joseph rises and leads his family under the care under his care, obediently as God had instructed him. Now, can you imagine having that kind of dream? I'm sure we've all had those kinds of dreams that are kind of concerning. You know, the, the ones where there's a fire breaks out or there's a massive accident and someone you love and cherish dies in the dream and like you wake up and it's, you're sweating or whatever. I mean, that's the kind of dream Joseph has. You've got to go because they're trying to kill Jesus. And then, of course, you would probably tend to think, well, what are they going to do with me? What are they going to do with Mary? Like, if they get a hold of Jesus, what are they going to do to us? I mean, we're, we're the ones that are caring for him. We're the, 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 the earthly roles of mom and dad in his life. Can you imagine that, that stress? I mean, after all this effort and planning God had done over generations to bring his presence into the world, to show people what he was like, to pay the penalty for sin, and now King Herod wants to bring it all to an end? I mean, Joseph could have been fearful here. He, he could have even abandoned this whole task in this moment. He could have woken up and said, okay, that's where I draw the line. Like, I was fine with taking on this baby and being the stepdad and Mary and all of this and believing God for that, but now they're wanting to kill us? Okay, I'm, I'm sneaking out the back door. Mary and Jesus, you, you guys need to go to, to Egypt. That's what God said, but I'm not going with you. I didn't sign up for this. But no, Joseph, he's present. He didn't withdraw. He's active. He's not passive. And Joseph has made the choice to lead his family forward into God's future for them. He is all in, full of faith, whatever the cost. Isn't it interesting that in Joseph's response throughout the birth account of Jesus, we know very little about Joseph. But what we do see about Joseph is something we will see 33 years later in Jesus. A resolve to be obedient to God no matter the cost. We can see the kind of influence and why it was God the Father selected Joseph to be the earthly influence in Jesus' life. It also shows the powerful responsibility and impact a dad has in the life of a son. So he's being a loving and protective and obedient dad. And he leads his family as God directs him without hesitation. He does it before the sun comes up. Now I'm thinking about the implications of the presence of God within us, what we've already talked about. Paul communicates this to Timothy about God being in us through his Holy Spirit. And just how significantly God has changed who we are and what we're capable of because of him. Paul tells young Timothy this. He says in 2 Timothy 1, he says, Buddy, God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-control, self-discipline. Did you know the spirit Paul's talking about here? that is at work in Paul, and that he's saying is at work is in Timothy, is the same spirit we see at work in Joseph, and the same spirit we have access to in our own lives. The spirit of the, power, the, 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 spirit of the Savior of the world, that spirit of power and love and self-control to guide us and direct us. <coughs> that same presence, that same power is at work within us through the power of God's Holy Spirit. I mean, here we are just two Sundays into the Advent season, the experience of Christmas expecting the arrival of Jesus and all that his presence in this world means. And sometimes we lose sight of the fact that he is still present in us now, today, just as powerful as he was then. And in many ways, even more powerful because he's spread out among all of us. That's why Jesus says we will do greater things than him. Not because we're so great, but the power of God's Holy Spirit at work in all of us is that great. 
And yet we've only looked at just the shepherds and Joseph and we've identified fundamental things about who we are as followers of Jesus that if we're honest, oftentimes we think we have to do things to be like this. And God says, no, you can't do anything to be this way. This is who I am and this is what I've done in you because of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. So I want to ask you, if you've said yes to Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus, do you really know who you are, and do you believe you are who God says that you are? Let's run down the list of these eight things we've covered just in two Sundays. Do you really believe you're a friend of God, or do you believe you're constantly at odds with Him? Do you really believe that you are complete in Christ, that you're good enough, that that, that it's Christ's perfection that makes you acceptable to Him? It's not your ability Number three, do you really believe you're his masterpiece recreated in Christ for a purpose or do you still feel like junk on it often? <clears throat> do you really believe the Heavenly Father is a loving dad who has your back? Do you really believe in you're living your life according to the fact that you are the temple of the living God, the, the presence of God exists within you and you have the same power at work in you that raised Christ from the dead? Do you really believe you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength? It's not about your strength, it's about His. Do you really believe and live your life overcoming your flesh because of your close relationship with His Spirit already present within you? And do you recognize and live out this truth that you believe you don't have a spirit of fear and timidity, but you have a spirit of power, love, and self-control? If you're a Jesus follower, that's who you are, those eight things. You can't control it, you can't change it. That's who you are. The question is, do you believe it? And are you building your life around it? Experiencing God's more and better for you. Or are you just trying to find your own version of more and better that when compared to God's, will fall significantly short? Are you resting that who you are at its most valuable and worthy is who God says you are, not what you can do on your own. Because when you rest that God declares who you are and you rest in that, you discover the more and better that he's designed you for. And it's beyond anything you've dreamed of. Beyond all you could ask or imagine because your life is now empowered by a force and strength that is far beyond your capacity could ever be. Tonight, today, kind of in, in light of this message, in the context of this message, I want to invite someone to come up and join me here in a second. Uh, we have someone in the life of our church that's been a, a young man that's been volunteering in our infused student ministry now uh, for a little over a year, and God's been doing some in cool things in his life over the last few years, and, uh, and even bringing him here to Fusion in this season of his life has, has had a huge impact on him. Um, but he's going to soon be entering a new season where God is, is really calling him in, in similar fashion to Joseph to step out of what's comfortable, to step out of what's predictable, to step out of, out of what even would, we would call maybe the American dream or the typical plan for life and place himself in an environment that's going to be incredibly challenging, incredibly risky, and full of faith. Uh, and he's going to be stepping on to a foreign mission field right here from our home church. He's going to go away to a to get training and equipping to go to a foreign mission field somewhere in a place that's really, really dark. So will you join me in welcoming Matt? I'm going to invite Matt up to join me. Just welcome Matt up here. And everybody just say, hey, Matt. If you don't don't know Matt, this is Matt Brown. Um, And he's kind of sensed a real calling on his life in this season uh, in somewhat of a short-term fashion, but, but to step outside of where he's at right now living life and kind of deeper into his relationship with God and trust God for something um, bigger. And he's going he's gonna to move in a direction that, that could be very, very scary. And I want you to hear a little bit of his story. Share with us a little bit, Matt, what's, what God's been doing in your life over the last few years. Well, over the last few years, um, <laughs> I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, my family actually attends <laughs> this church. Um, but as I got older, I left the church, and I went the complete opposite way, got into stuff I shouldn't have. And it resulted in a drug overdose at the age of 21. And um, that's where I actually met Christ, was in the midst of a drug overdose. And um, life got a little rougher for me after that. I had a few speed bumps. um, But I ended up in a program called Teen Challenge. And I was there for two years. And the Lord stripped me of everything. Stripped me of relationships. Stripped me of house, car, family, everything. Um, 
but the work he did inside my heart, like I wouldn't trade that for the world. Mm. The relationship That's I good. gained with him and just the things he's shown me along the way. It's good. So share with us a little bit about after the new year, what, where are you going to be going? What are you going to be doing? Um, well, I will be heading out to Colorado Springs to a missions training school um, called Axe. It is uh, uh, it's about Antioch, a, Center, Antioch for Center for Training, training and, and Study. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll be there for 10 weeks in prayer, fasting, and the study of God's word. And then after that, I will be uh, shipped out to, it's called the 1040 window of the world. Um, it's about 10, 10 degrees latitude, latitude 40 and 40 degrees, degrees longitude yeah. um, over there. Um, the regions of North Africa, the Middle East, uh, South Asia, and Eurasia. And um, I'll be focusing on basically evangelizing God's word. Um, the school focuses on training missionaries to go plant churches in these parts of the world. Um, so it's going to be a journey. Yeah, there'll be cult, uh, countercultural training to yeah. kind of familiarize yourself with largely Muslim or Hindu cultures. Uh, he doesn't know exactly where he'll be deployed yet. In fact, when he does find out, he won't even be able to share that with anybody. It'll be an undisclosed location because uh, Christian mission organizations' presence in this area of the world is incredibly risky and dangerous. Um, you know, it's interesting in the culture in which we find ourselves, we think about missions, world missionaries, and, and, uh, and their effectiveness, and they are. But over 90% of world missionaries are in places that are friendly to the gospel. Um, there's less than 10% of missionaries active in this area of the world where there's 2.8 billion people that reside. Uh, so by and large, most countries in this, all the dark red means that over 90% of those people groups have not been reached yet with the gospel. So as you get lighter in red, it means more percentages of the people groups have been reached with the gospel, or at least the gospel has spread. Um, but it's still incredibly, incredibly dangerous to be on the ground there speaking of the name of Jesus. Um, what is it that, so, so you're going to go for 10 weeks to be prepared and equipped to go out and be a part of that for eight weeks, and who knows what God is going to lead you to as a next step beyond that, uh, what, what the next step looks like. So over the next three to four months of your life, you're going to be uh, in, in this whole new season. What is it you're most excited about? I'm most excited about just being part of whatever culture God places me in amongst those people and just really seeing um, people come to Christ and seeing healings, deliverances, and just really immersing myself within the culture. Cool. What are you scared about? Not coming back. Okay. <laughs> not coming back. Yeah. And, and, you know, that could be a scary thing of not coming back, uh, just the, the risk of what's happening over there. You see it on the news. These are many of the nations, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, uh, India, uh, China, places where you see some of those horrific things on display. Um, but the other reality is there's no guarantee a he, what, what God begins to do through him there. It might just open the door for it to be even more of a, a long-term sort of thing as well. Well, you're part of our home church here. You're part of us, and you've been serving in the Fuge ministry. And I know Pauline and many of the teens are not excited about you leaving, although they're excited to see you go and be a part of that. Um, talk about your prayer cards. Talk about how we can support you. Next Sunday, we're going to show a cool video with you. Uh, and we're actually going to be offering you the opportunity to give. We're going to do a love offering for Matt as he's doing fundraising uh, to make this a reality for him and investing in him, but more than that, investing in the gospel, spreading to parts of the world that are incredibly desperate, incredibly dark. Um, and you're going to have an opportunity to give according to that next Sunday. But before we give, I've got an incredible video to share with you about um, a missionary going to a hard place and needing people to hold the rope for them. So how can we hold your rope going to a place? Um, well, right now... Uh, as I am part of the school currently, um, I'm going to need financial support um, as I have a large amount of money I need to raise um, by March, um, which will cover my housing, immunizations, and basically food costs overseas. And I won't be going with much. I'll pretty much be going with a backpack and my Bible. And we're going to be going out for eight weeks um, on foot, basically evangelizing the gospel. It's not a work-based missions, but it's more so we're going to be speaking like I am with you now. So conversational that, yeah, dialogue, conversational, relationships, relational, um, one -on -one. within the context of those cultures yeah. as you get equipped for that. So, And share about your prayer cards. Um, I have prayer cards in the back that have a little more information. Um, there's a link that you can, if you feel led to donate um, straight to uh, the school, 
And um, what, if you donate, uh, all funds, because it's a nonprofit organization, is like taxable or whatever. Non taxable. Non taxable. So yes. you can write that off on your taxes. And uh, any support I can get is uh, appreciated. So he's got a few hundred of those cards. He's going to be just outside the double doors here at a table there. So if you'd like to stop by just to encourage him to pick up a card and be praying over Matt, you know, this isn't something where you wait till the first of the year to pray for when he's gone. You pray now for the people God is already working on that they're preparing to interact with him and other people that are a part of this class that will be going together to Colorado Springs in January. This is not just Matt. This is a group of people that are going on this journey in this season of life. And maybe there's somebody here in the life of our church who would say, hey, that idea of of an 18-week thing, man, that, that turns my crank. I want to know more about that. Maybe there's someone else here. This would lead to you wanting to do something very similar to this in the future. But, but between now and next Sunday, I just encourage you to prayerfully consider how God might cause you to give uh, in some way, whatever way you can, to give, to, to turn a light on in an otherwise very, very dark place and invest in what God wants to do in places that otherwise won't hear the gospel if someone doesn't have the courage to be willing to go. So we're going to pray over Matt, and then uh, we're going to share with you a quick video about Acts so you kind of have a better understanding of them as a a parachurch organization and a world missions organization, and even hear a couple of testimonies of the impact that, that Acts has had in many of these places. Lord God, we thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for how you change who we are, God. Your word is just clear about it. Jesus is clear about it. That we are now your friends. That, that, uh, that, that we now have a loving dad and a family to be a part of. Lord, your word is so clear. What we've talked about today, that we are the temple of the living God. That you reside within us, your Holy Spirit, because of what Christ accomplished in laying down his life to pay the penalty for our sin. Lord, that, that as we carry you with us, we can do all things through you who gives us strength. That we can even overcome the desires of our flesh by living in communion with your Holy Spirit. And that, God, we don't have a spirit of fear and timidity, but we have a spirit of power and love and self-control. We see those things exhibited in Joseph. And, Lord, we know that that Matt is going to need to be reminded of those truths as well. Lord, I pray over those four things for each of us that are here today. Would you help us to gravitate to one that we can cling to, one we can hold on to, to say this is one of those ones I, I often forget or I'm not believing that God is always with me, that, that I have uh, the power of, or the, the spirit of power and love and self-discipline, that, that I can overcome my flesh by being in communion with your spirit, that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Lord, help us to cling to one of those this week, not so that we have more to do, but we have more to believe about who you are and the significance of what you've changed in us because of the gift of your son. God, we do pray over Matt. We pray over his time of training and equipping in Colorado Springs, the preparations that he's making, that his family's making, the risk he's taking. God, we pray for the field that he'll be deployed to, the culture, the neighborhood, the faces and names that Jesus Christ died for. Lord, we lift them up to you. We pray that already you're preparing their hearts, not only for Matt to speak with, but for anybody else that's there, for acts as an organization on the ground in this very dark, very difficult place in our world. Lord, when we look at Jesus, we know that you went to the places that were the darkest and the most desperate to the people who felt the most desperate, and you brought light and hope, and you showed them love. Lord, would you do that same thing through Matt? But would you also help each of us to see, Lord, that where we are tomorrow, in our neighborhood, at our work, even with our families, that there are places of darkness we can step in and be the light of Jesus Christ. Would you help us to see that it's just as urgent for us to enter into the darkness and carry the light as it is to go half a world away to do it. We worship you, God, and we thank you for inviting us into this great mission to seek and save that which is lost, to reach one more at any cost. In your holy name we pray, amen.